This is Beatrice Mady, the director and curator of the Fine Arts Gallery at St. Peter's University. It is my pleasure to introduce the second virtual show of the fall 2020 season, Gerald Hayes, Reconstructing Die Cuts. Jerry has been making art for many decades with work in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art and the Addison Gallery of Art. He is shown with the Mitchell Algis Gallery and the Denise Bibro Gallery in New York City, just to mention a few. So without further ado, let's hear Jerry in his own words talk about his recent work. I'm Jerry Hayes. I'm in my studio today where I'm putting together some images for a, a virtual exhibition that we're doing. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a longtime New Yorker. I'm living in Lower Manhattan for many years in Tribeca. And during that time, I was also faculty at Pratt Institute in the Fine Arts Department until 2006, when my family and I moved to a small town, small coastal town, only 18 miles east of Boston, where we live now, and I have a, my studio here. These relief paintings I'll show you evolved from some two-dimensional paintings, like this one here, which was painted in 2016. For a long time, I've had an interest in die cut packaging materials used commercially. This may be due to my interest in design from my undergraduate art school study, but it was after graduate school when I was teaching at the University of Illinois that I created many paintings on paper by spraying paint through the openings of flat, discarded cardboard display sheets that I would lay down on the paper and then remove after the spraying was finished. The painting from 2016, which I call Duplex, is on a birch veneer panel. Uh, here I stenciled and then I painted the shapes that I had drawn, I guess, from the, a, a packaging design that I had found. This is one of the last paintings I think I did that was flat or two-dimensional. So it was after completing this painting, I decided to use the ready-made object itself in new works by cutting the wood panel to contain the pressed paper form. The wood support isolated the image like a stage in the same way a mat frames a print, drawing, or watercolor. To be more visible, here are some of the found pressed paper pieces that I repurposed as the process is sometimes called. I like the term repurpose. As you see, I often cut and reassemble the forms into new shapes and, and patterns. Some time ago, I thought I'd mention that a painter I knew, Jack Whitten, said that there's a difference between painting a painting and making a painting. At that time, Jack was cutting small acrylic paint pieces and attaching them to his painting surface like a mosaic. Uh, his statement was quite true. In order for me to make my painting, to, to make my painting, it would involve construction by measuring, sawing, gluing, and sanding the wood platform, then gessoing both sides of the press paper before the painting even started. So making a painting is quite different from, as he said, painting a painting, and often more like construction or sculpture or architecture. In the past three years, I've created a hybrid of these industrial die-cut packaging forms on a flat painting surface. Sculpture, as you know, is finite and real, while painting is illusion. But by my 
melding or blending the two together, the work acquires a kind of physical presence in the same way a collage or anything attached to a painting surface would reel highlights and cast shadows. This is why I refer to these works as relief paintings or painted reliefs. In most of the reliefs, I've limited color in order to avoid being decorative. I can't just arbitrarily add color. Usually, I will rhyme or match the paint color on the wood panel with the beige tan neutral color of the cardboard. Or I will use a non-color or neutral color like gray or white. Sculptors traditionally have let the work stand without painting, letting the inherent color of the material be its color. So it's been with some selectivity that I've added color to my relief paintings. Like I said, I've let the unpainted brown packaging be its own color. At uh, different times while I'm working, the artwork itself seems to suggest the next move. Of course, from choices I made in previous work, I make new decisions that take the work to its new completion or to its finish. I do have a few options, but I still don't know in advance exactly what the painting will look like until all decisions are resolved. Let me say something about my titles, which titles have always been interesting to me and are often found by chance or by association. After the untitled firehouse relief was completed, I happened to see a real firehouse or a fire station nearby with the same intense red doors. So it was there that I found the title. Now, of course, if I hadn't seen that firehouse, the painting would now have a different title. So I suppose it's always personal. I associated the central form in this painting touched tomb with an ancient sarcophagus shape, like an Egyptian tomb that you may see at the Metropolitan Museum. Mine was named after King Tutankhamun. Two relief paintings I've titled with numbers embossed on the press paper forms themselves, as you can see here, as they're in relief on these recessed circles. Usually I don't make two paintings that are quite so similar, but I had these forms and it seemed like it might be the beginning of a new series of works. One piece was so badly damaged I had to scavenge a, a portion of another panel to make it complete. I titled a relief work from this year, Silence, after a book title by the composer-musician John Cage. The singular central image in my painting seemed so quiet and silent that the title was fitting. I also dedicated another painting, Jax, to the painter Paul Feely, recalling our similar use of a jack shape, which is in a child's game of jacks. Uh, often when I cut and then paint stencil shapes onto my wood panels, the silhouette may graphically resemble a real object. The painting's pantry and nature mort both have positive or negative shapes that resemble bottles in a still life. So again, this idea just evolved during the process of making the work and the titles followed. Bottle images were not planned, but were suggested by the shapes in the ready-made relief that I used. Several of the pressed paper forms that I found were used inside boxes for shipping large objects, usually, in this case, kitchen products, like uh, rice cookers, pasta makers, bread machines, and so forth. The shapes of these large container-like forms suggested to me big venues like arena, a coliseum, or one I titled Diamond on Squares. In two of these works, I imposed overlapped divisions as a way of bringing the supporting wood panel into the work. And the simple division of shapes that overlap the existing 3D relief object merged the painting with the relief. Uh, by chance or by choice, as to know how to divide the square, my diamond painting has the same divisions 
as the non-objective Russian painter Kazimir Malevich is painting four squares from 1915. On my work, I turned the square on its point, making the square a diamond, which I mounted in relief on the squares. In three small works from 2018, entitled Turn, Fists, and Paths, shown here on a wall together, and then individually, I use vertical color paths that run over the small objects. Then they are reversed into the opposite color path or flipped, making their work more puzzle-like or unexpected. Less, as they say, is often more. It was an idea or a simple solution for my using such small objects. Paintings, at least for me, don't have to be big to be important. Uh, from those small paintings, I've ironically created even smaller works. But I have said before that paintings don't have to be big to be important. Uh, just recently, I eliminated the wood stage or uh, platform from the earlier work. And there's one on the wall here that is completed, a relief, and there are three that are in progress. I think and I hope they will lead me to unexpected, uh, important new direction for my work.